Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome author James Andrew Miller and moderator Pat Morrison. Hi. Thanks for coming. I don't know what this is. Nope. Doesn't work. Anyway, thank you all for coming. I echo exactly what James Andrew Miller has to say. There's a scene, I think it's in Singing in the Rain, where Gene Kelly, dressed up, goes to New York to make his big break, and it's a very stylized set, and he goes door to door, opens the door of the talent agency, and says, gotta dance, and they slam the door in his face, over and over and over. So that's like my first conception of what a talent agency is really about, <laughs> is saying no to Gene Kelly, and think, ah, that's, you know, there you go. But this is an extraordinary talent agency that's the subject of the book Powerhouse about CAA. And I don't know, maybe it hasn't been since United Artists, Mary Pickford, uh, Charlie Chaplin, D.W. Griffith, Doug Fairbanks formed United Artists in the Hotel Alexandria in Los Angeles that you've had such a powerful and influential company in show business. So can you talk first about what CAA did and why it was so different from the agencies that had gone before it. Sure. Um, I love stories of disruption, which is why I uh, wrote a book on Saturday Night Live and one on ESPN. And I think um, in some ways what I was trying to do with this book is look back at the last 40 years in Hollywood. And CAA became the best vehicle to do that because CAA kind of changed the rules. They did, they basically looked at the way things were done in so many different areas, and they said, why does it have to be that way? In fact, that doesn't make sense. We're going to do it this way. And if you want, I can get into some examples. But the whole point is that there were five guys in 1975 who had been fired from William Morris. And they got fired. They weren't expecting to get fired. They set up some bridge tables in an office that a friend of theirs gave them and their wives answered the phone. Each of the five wives took turns that uh, day of the week answering the phones and doing scheduling. And they didn't have a penny to their name. And within you know, 10 years, 15 years, um, one of the partners, Michael Ovitz, was um, largely regarded as the most powerful man in Hollywood. And it is still the most successful agency in Hollywood 40 years later. So like, how the heck does that happen? I mean, obviously they, they were onto something that, um, you know, and by the way, William Morris was like the giant, right? And all these others. So I wanted to understand how that happened and follow it through to the days now where Meryl Streep, you know, um, Reese Witherspoon, Tom Cruise, and I could go on and on. They're all represented by CA. And the, the Broadway agency model that I was talking about why didn't that work for Hollywood? Why did Hollywood need something different? Well, I, it's hard to answer that question just in an abstract because sometimes Hollywood needed certain things at different times, right? And I think that one of the things that happened was, a lot. Uh, you know, in 1975, um, William Morris was playing by the old rules. And so it became much more of a seller's market. Um, and so I'll just give you one quick example. To when CA decided, they, they decided to make it a seller's market. And so what they would do was, in the old days, the studio would call and say, listen, we have this role for Paul Newman. Do you, do you want Paul, you know, let's see if Paul Newman will do it. So they gave it to Paul Newman, he read the script, he said, I don't want it. And so William, at William Morris, they would just call up the studio and say, no, sorry, Newman, he's not gonna do it. At CAA, they kept that script. And they said, okay, Newman may not wanna do it, but Let's get Robert Redford to read it. Let's get Dustin Hoffman to read it. Oh wait, but it's, it's this gorgeous, you know, tall, blonde-haired guy. Dustin Hoffman can't do that. Well, let's get one of our writers in. Let's, let's see how we can change the story about that. So by the time they call back to the studio, they say, listen, we got this all worked out. We got Dustin Hoffman directing it, uh, starring in it. We got our, one of our directors. We got this one already com you know, committed. And it's like the studio saying, well, that's not what we really thought of, but Come to think of it, you've already put the movie together for us, so we'll do it. And by the way, Tootsie, a great example of that. I mean, I could go on movie after movie after movie where basically 
CA decided to take control of the intellectual property and make it something that the studio couldn't turn down. So a CAA as it operated would not have been possible in the heyday of the studio system in all likelihood when it was the studio that called all of those shots. CAA ended up having this version of vertical investment really where they had somebody invested in this at every stage of the operation, the script writers, the stars, and everything else. Yeah, I guess, but you know, the weird thing about CAA is that there's these, with all due respect to the other founders, there were two guys, Michael Ovitz and Ron Meyer, who were at the core of this company for the first 20 years. And um, in a weird Jerry Maguire kind of way, they completed each other because Ovitz wanted to be feared and Ron wanted to be loved. And Ovitz was out there crushing people on deals and making sure that he had, you know, always the upper hand and was perceived as a power broker. And Ron was inside mentoring agents and also Ron's client list was amazing. So I think that just in the old studio system, I mean, if you looked, Ron once showed me his call list, you know, like in, in the, it's every, I mean, his, just his actresses alone, they all, every, all of them were up for Academy Awards all the time. I, I mean, it was, it was just ridiculous. I mean, and so he was so good at taking care of these clients, I think he would have survived at kind of any system there was. It seemed in the old days that agents were the power brokers behind the scene, but CAA was very much in front. It was as much a, a high profile player as any of the people it represented. They just weren't there making the movies on set. Yeah, in fact, if you go uh, to Beverly Hills and at the corner of Wilshire and Santa Monica, you can still see the old CA building, which they um, grew out of rather quickly. But at the time, I mean, Ovitz had Marvel brought in from Italy, and I.M. Pei de designed it. It's the first building he designed west of the Mississippi. Um, and when they opened it, they had President Bill Clinton come to uh, start the, start the uh, to open up the building. He had uh, Lichtenstein build a, I mean, painted a beautiful mural mural in the in the atrium and you know that night it was Steven Spielberg and Tom Cruise and every single actors and every single actor so they were making it was about the brand of CAA you know they even uh, did these things with like in the old days uh, script covers with their with big it was just solid red with big CAA white letters and they would go and leave them in uh, doctor's offices West Side Doctor's Office. West Side Doctor's Offices. So, I mean, they wanted to be ubiquitous. They, um, Ovitz had them all, like in the third year, they all, he went out and leased five Jaguars for the five partners, and it was CA, the license plate, CA1, CA2, CA3. So when they were at restaurants and when they were at openings and where they're everything, they, he just wanted to flood the zone, the entire town. And so if you're at William Morris at ICM or whatever, you're like sitting there and all of a sudden this like tsunami's washing over you. It's like, what the heck? And P.S., they were stealing clients left and right. Um, and, uh, you know, if any of you have ever met Ron Meyer, you will know that he's a very uh, difficult guy to um, say no to. In fact, he told me the story of once hiding out behind a plant in Hawaii along the beach where he knew Sylvester Stallone took morning walks. And so Sly was walking down. This is right after Rocky. Uh, Rocky. He's walking down the beach, and Ron ducks out from a tree and says, oh, hey, funny to run into you here. And he had, you know. And, and yet it was that devotion to clients that cost him his relationship with Ali McGraw, did you? Yeah, so uh, imagine, so Ron Meyer's like a, sh you know, short Jewish guy, well over four feet, and all of a sudden <laughs> he's got his uh, Shiksa goddess in uh, Ali McGraw, and they were together for a year and a half, and you know, for those of you who might not remember, Ali McGraw was the top of the food chain. I mean, she's just, besides the fact that she's beautiful and a lovely person, she's just the most coveted. And Ron was with her, and they were living together for about a year and a half. And uh, he tells a story in the book about it was a Saturday morning, and this is before cell phones and before texts and everything else, so he had to be available all the time. And he was on the phone with, I think it was Cher, because Cher, Jane Fond, I mean, I could go through the whole list. But anyway, he was doing what an agent does, which was holding her hand and walking her through a lot of the crises that she was facing that morning. May have been Streisand, I'm not sure. That would have been a deeper, anyway. Um, <laughs> but, um, and as he, uh, as, he's, as he was talking, 
we saw Allie go to the closet, start packing up her clothes, reach out for a suitcase, and start holding it up. And, you know, he couldn't hang up the phone on his client. And she walked out the door, and um, she just, and I interviewed her, and she was very honest. She said, I just, I couldn't take it anymore because it's 24-7. I mean, you know, it's, um, I'll just say one more thing. I don't mean to be long-winded about this answer, but here's the peculiar thing about being an agent. It's like um, you wake up every morning wondering if this is the day your client's going to fire you. And for, you know, and you see these um, actors and actresses thanking their agents on Academy Award night, and you think, you know, you're coated in Teflon, and the relationship is, you know, just like this. And then, lo and behold, your next movie may be a total bomb, and somebody else from another agency said, how could your agent let you take that role? We would have never let you take that role. That movie was not worth it. And all of a sudden, they're saying goodbye to you. So it's a very insecure existence, and every single day, you're trying your best to make sure that they love you and they want you. And uh, it's, a, it's a, I mean, the emotional part of being an agent, I think, is greater than the acumen involved. Because it's so much about, you know, who trusts you, who's on your side, who you've lost. Did that sort of poaching go on? You mentioned it from CAA's point of view, to be taking other people's clients, wooing other people's clients. And the wooing was extraordinary. There's one story about Sherry Lansing and the, the, the umbrellas and the salt was, I'm trying to remember exactly what that was, but, the, but it was oh, seen yeah. characteristic of the way that they would say to a client, we will care for you, we will look out for you, this is how much we care about your career. Yeah, I mean, look, I think before CA, there may have been poaching like this, and CA made the poaching like that. Um, no one was safe. And by the way, the other thing that happened on movies, I mean, this is so ridiculous. Um, Ovitz used to insist that when it was a um, CA director, oftentimes the casting sessions would be at CAA. It wouldn't be at the studio. So can you imagine, like, you're a William Morris client, and the good news is that your client is up for this great job directed by, you know, Sidney Pollack or somebody like that, and um, the bad news is that it's at CA. So the moment they walk in, welcome to our beautiful building. Oh my God, we, we love you. We think you're fantastic. Come have, I mean, they were to be bar mitzvah receptions for these people. I mean, tons of food, catered things, everything like that. And they're telling you how great they're, and by the time, you know, they're done auditioning for that job, there's two things going on in their mind. One, did I get the role and B, this is a pretty nice place. <laughs> Everybody's really nice. And the other thing that Ovitz did was, you know, if you were a young agent that he liked, he would give you like $5,000 and say, get over to Armani which of course the Armani purse sales failed people were in cahoots with CAA because Ovitz had won them over. So it was like, get yourself some nice suits. And it was black suits and certain kinds of ties. And for the women, it was certain kinds of looks. I mean, he, there was not one detail that um, wasn't paid attention to. And uh, as opposed to, you know, other places that didn't really care about that kind of stuff. So it was just this huge disparity between life at CAA and life at other places. You talked to more than 500 people. I know, I'm pathetic. For, for this book. <laughs> who, was, who were the tough nuts to crack, and how did you do it? You're talking about wooing clients. You had to woo people to talk to you. Tom Cruise had never uh, been interviewed for a book before, so for some reason that seemed to be like a big thing for him. So as a result, I felt like I was climbing Everest on a cold day in my shorts. Um, <laughs> that took about seven months. Um, uh, I think that there, you know, look, a lot of these people don't like talking about themselves, and they certainly don't like talking about their agents because, what do you say, well, like, I'm really dependent on them, then it makes it seem like they're not strong, and I count on them for roles, no, but I will tell you that some of the, I mean, there were some amazing interviews, uh, and I don't say that because of my interviewing prowess, but just because of who they are, but um, if you do pick up the book, I mean, Nicole Kidman, you know, one of the things that happens is, when you see these people on a TV show or, or a movie, right, they're reading a script. And they're reading a script that they didn't even write 90% of the time, 90% of the time. So like, who really, who, and they're actors, so what are they like? I mean, uh, sometimes you get heartbroken when you've loved somebody up on the screen and you can't wait to meet them and you go to an interview and, uh, you know, they act like a real creep. And, um, and that's disheartening. And then you have situations like Nicole Kidman who is, 
you know, beyond lovely, so smart, so raw, so, I mean, she talks about, I guess after she and Tom, do you mind, can I take a second for this? After she and Tom got divorced, she went back to Australia. She was very upset. She was, um, you know, she was in bed, she just curled up. And her agent, Kevin Huvain, who's now one of the partners at CA, who's an amazing agent, and was the one who forced S Sarah Jessica Parker to do Sex in the City. She didn't want to do that. Kevin said, you have to. Anyway, yada, yada, yada. He calls her and he says, we got, there's a script, and I think you should do it. And Nicole says, I can't, I can't. I just don't have the energy for it. And he said, no, I think you need to do it. And Nicole says to me, and she looked, you know, she said, Jim, I just had nothing in my tank. I, I couldn't do it, and it was a very difficult role. And I'll make a long story short, which is that she winds up talking about how she had to trust him at that moment and how he gave her, you know, like literally the, you know, the proverbial gas in her tank to come over back to the state, shoot the movie. P.S. She won the Academy Award for it. You know, but for her to be that vulnerable and, um, you know, I think there's a lot of people in there. I think, you know, knock on wood, the reason why the book did well was because I think there are a lot of people in there that, that reveal parts of themselves that, um, you know, they don't normally do. The lengths to which they went for their clients, but also to make things work in the agency, comes clear through a number of your interviews. And the, the bomb threat story is the, I mean, it's hard to call it a funny story, but I guess it is. So if you're a, uh, an assistant at the agency, I mean, you are at the mercy of your boss, and your boss is at the mercy of a client. So um, this was early on, but Peter Sellers had fired a producer off a movie that he was on, and uh, they replaced him with another producer. And it turns out Peter Sellers calls and says, uh, listen, uh, the movie is shooting in, in uh, Paris, by the way. He says, look, this new guy is awful. I want the old guy back, and I want him back right now. So Peter's agent says to the assistant, look, um, call the guy and get him back over to Paris right away, tonight, on the flight. There's a 6 o'clock flight. Or find out what the flight is. And this is before cell phones, before texting, before anything. And so the guy calls his house. Oh, no, he's out to dinner. We don't know where, where he is. So this kid starts going to, like, all the fancy restaurants, calling all the fancy restaurants in Beverly Hills and Hollywood. Is he there? Is he there? Is he there? Find, finally, he finds a place. It's like 5.30 or 6 o'clock, I forget. And the flight is, uh, yeah, anyway, a couple hours. Uh, an hour and a half, maybe two hours. And um, he says to the guy, listen, you got to go to LAX and get on the plane. You're, gonna, you're going back to the The guy goes, well, I can't possibly make it. I have no clothes. I'm still here. He goes, you got to get there. He goes, just drive. I'm having a car pick you up right now, and it's going to race you to the airport. And he's looking, at the, uh, he's looking at his watch, and he realizes they're not going to make it. So all he knew was his boss said, better, get on that, better be on that plane. And um, so he did the only natural thing that all of us would do. He called in a bomb threat to the plane. <laughs> and, um, and the plane was delayed for two and a half hours. Guy made the plane. Um, but the best part of the story was when his boss came back in and said, um, yeah, you know, uh, did he get on the plane? He got on the plane, right? He goes, oh, yes, he got on the plane, everything's fine. He goes, good. He goes, well, Tommy, look, how did that work? He goes, well, I tell you, I, I, I confess, uh, I called in a bomb threat um, to delay the plane. His boss goes, okay, good. And he calls <laughs> because it's just ends justifies the means. Um, there was a particular star who was... No, no, was are, are we still sending him parcels in prison, this guy, or what? No, no, he was... The first time he told the story, I think, was to me, and he had calculated the statute of limitations. <laughs> um, or as Kramer would say, the statue of limitations. But um, there was... Look, I mean, every single day, they go through that. There was a thing 15 years ago where one of their important clients was filming in Ireland and wanted a Stairmaster... Um, there in the in the countryside in Ireland, mind you, and for some reason at that time there was no place in Ireland that carried stairmasters because he wanted a particular model of staircase. So somebody went out, bought it, and uh, flew it over there. Um, 
there was a kid who literally flew over the Stairmaster, delivered it to the countryside of Ireland, and, and flew home. I mean, there's no request that, um, that an agent receives from an important client that, that can be ignored. Just can't. Just think, how does this look from afar if you're like in Ohio when you're looking at all this and you're saying, really, is this how Hollywood works? Well, you either envy it because you think, oh my gosh, I wish I had somebody doing that for me, or you uh, think it's a crazy world. And, you know, I think, I mean, somebody once said that they took the United States and they slanted it and everything loose fell into Hollywood. Yeah, Frank Lloyd Wright, the, what, the fruits and the nuts, I yeah. think he said. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, you kind of get, get used to it. But I think that the level of requests through the years have become much more complicated because it's a fast-moving world, so the, these clients believe that there's nothing that they can or should want that uh, their agents shouldn't, shouldn't get to them. So as a Hollywood script, if you were to film a version of this book, you would open with these five plucky guys who just got fired from their old agency, and they say, we're going to get together and put on fill in the blank a show, in this case, you know, an agency. And then they do a great job, and they build it up, and then things start besetting them, the problems, internal, external, hubris, whatever. Talk about that arc and how, how that first iteration of CAA came to Yeah, a that's, bad that's end. a great question because for me, um, I mean, it's like Shakespeare. Um, the middle of the book for me was like Shakespeare. There's like probably six or seven Shakespeare plays that I could um, relate to it. And basically what happens sometimes is um, that old adage, when the Lord wants to punish you, he answers your prayers. So Ron and Michael are like this, right? They were kids together at William Morris. They left, they got fired on the same day. They started this company. They became the most powerful people in Hollywood. And 20 years later, um, Michael was offered the job of running Universal Studios. Ron was trying to help him get it. Michael kept on negotiating, negotiating, and uh, there's that little Hamlet part in there, but uh, finally said kind of no. And then he, he said, Ron said, I think you're making a mistake. I really think you should get this job because Ron wanted Michael the hell out of there. Um, so Michael said, ah, you know what? Go talk to Edgar Broffin Jr., who's running Universal at that time, and see if you can get this back. Ron sits down with Edgar Jr. I mean, you can't make this shit up, right? And uh, says, uh, and Ron says, listen, let's, I, I'm here to try and close this deal for Michael. You know, let's get this done. And Edgar says, yeah, um, we're, we're really tired of Michael. We don't like the way he's negotiated. We decided we're going to go some, to someone else. And Ron goes, that's too bad. And he goes, yeah, we want you. <laughs> so Ron's sitting there and he goes, really? So he said yes because he wanted to get away from Michael and he was ready for something new. So he leaves the meeting, calls Michael. And Michael says, so how'd the meeting go? And he goes, well, not the way you might have expected it. <laughs> he goes, oh, really? Um, what happened? He goes, well, um, they said they didn't want you, and they offered me the job. And Michael said, um, so you stole my job. And Rod said, no, I didn't steal your job. You left it in the trash, and I picked it up. And uh, that caused a schism. And there was one other, should I mention the Malibu thing for a second? So they didn't talk to each other for quite a while. <coughs> Michael ran, went to become president of Disney. Ron's running Universal. They weren't talking. And then Michael realized he really needed Ron through an intermediary, in an intermediary. They got together. They went for a walk. How's everything going? Good, 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 good. You know, what are you doing about a house? Oh, we, uh, this is Ron talking. We found some uh, land in Malibu. We're going we're gonna to buy it. It's Barry Gordy's next to Barry Gordy's property in Malibu. We're going to build a house there and everything. How's everything with you? Fine. So that's on a uh, Saturday. So that Monday morning, Ron calls his lawyer and says, by the way, let's um, put the bid in for the land and so we can start. And uh, the lawyer calls back an hour later and says, yeah, um, it's no longer available. He goes, what? He goes, yeah, um, somebody, somebody bought the land. And look, that's really weird. How, how is that possible? Um, and of course, you know, anybody with a triple-digit IQ would figure out that uh, Michael had gone and bought the land. 
Um, so they never spoke. So we were just talking. Um, when the book came out, um, I was able to get the two of them the th um, on stage together. It was the first time they were in public for 21 years. And the three of us sat there. I was were in, you the, in middle. the middle. Yes, I was in the middle. And, uh, and they, had, yeah, they had not been in public for 21 years. I, when I first started doing the book, and I started interviewing them each at their own houses and stuff, they wouldn't mention each other's names. And I just, you know, finally felt like Mo with the Three Stooges and clunked their heads together and said, you know, this is ridiculous that you guys walk in the same restaurant and you don't talk to each other. You built this amazing institution. You were like brothers, so at least um, we were able to uh, carve out that night. And uh, I'm happy to say that they're um, at peace with each other, although I still hear from each of them after they run into each other. You can't believe what he said. You can't believe what he's. But um, I think that. So um, you're the one on the phone all the time then. Well, it's my it's my joy. No, I'm just kidding. But um, I think that the the real answer to your question, though, is that there was such a breakup of this, of of I mean, in so many ways, all five of them had their own sagas. I mean, somebody died, somebody retired. But it was this thing with Michael and Ron was um, was really kind of uh, unfortunate, but very dramatic and very compelling. And so for me, it was one of the more exciting things to do in the book. So then did CAA have to reinvent itself after the split of that partnership of, well, of uh, trust, which was very rare in that business? So I'll tell you about one day. So Ron leaves to go to Universal. Michael's still there. But there's a bunch of people underneath that um, really feel like they want to take over, including like five young guys. Um, but Michael was there. He was very depressed because he figured out he didn't want to do it with Ron anymore. He gets the he calls everybody into his office at 9.30 in the morning one morning. He goes, in about half an hour, I'm going to be live on CNBC. I'm going to be announced as the new president of Disney. He didn't tell them until that day. Um, Michael Eisner and I are going on. So I wish you well. And he walked out. And um, P.S., it's not like, here's the combination to the safe. And in the safe, there's a succession plan. So all of a sudden, you know, do you remember in second grade when the teacher would leave the room for a moment and we all threw erasers at the board? It was all chaos. So you had basically 10 people um, who all thought that they were entitled, either them with somebody else or them by themselves to run the place. And um, you want to talk about Hollywood power struggles. It was pretty amazing. And, uh, and what was really amazing was that the five young guys prevailed. And... Um, and three of them, two of them are still there now. Um, so that's, that's a credit to them because uh, it was a very difficult time. But yes, the answer is they had to reimagine themselves. And by the way, can you imagine, given the clients list they had, that every si as soon as Ovitz was announced, as soon as Ron left and as soon as Ovitz left, every single agency is calling, saying, you got to come with us, you got to come with us. I mean, Michael Douglas left, but then came back. Sylvester Stallone left. Um, I mean, person after person after person. It was hunting season all over the place. And I give them a lot of credit that they were able to hold on to, uh, you know, as many people as they did. And some of the, and, and a lot of the ones that they lost wound up, you know, coming back. Before we take some questions, I want to ask whether how CAA structured itself has become a model for all the agencies in Hollywood. Is CAA what they aspire to be? Well, CAA has changed now. Um, you know, WME, which is one of the other competing William Old, William Morris agency now. Um, anybody want to guess what percentage of their revenue now comes from movie stars and directors? 20, 24%. When I interviewed Jennifer Lopez, I wanted to talk to her about, like, this... Uh, TV series that she started. She said, Jim, can I tell you about my clothing line? Sarah Jessica Parker, can I tell you about my perfume? Can I tell you about... So the movies, the studios are making less and less movies, right? And the, the, the numbers aren't as big before. You know, in the 90s, CA had like, I don't know, maybe 20 clients making more than $20 million a, a picture. They had directors that got first gross, which means you get a percentage of the real money, not the net profits. So I think that there was just this unbelievable financial equation, and it enabled Ovitz and Meyer to have a lot more power in a seller's market than they would now. In fact, I contend 
I say this to those guys all the time, they wouldn't have had the patience to survive in today's market. Because hmm. so fragmented? It's, it's, it's very fragmented and it's also more of a buyer's market. I mean, they're not, they're not making 25 movies a year. Um, I think Ron would have gone crazy having the call list that he had back then of like, you know, where's, where's a role, where's a role, where's a role? Back then, there was enough, you know, inventory to fill it. So I think that one of the things that happened now is they're both owned by private equity. And what's really happening is they're, they're making investments in new technology and in new ways of, uh, of getting content out into the world. And it's fascinating. And as a result, they're, they're spending more time with their parents, you know, their private equity owners, than they are with the clients. Um, William Morris Endeavor lost Aaron Sorkin, you know, last year, um, right before his, you know, first directorial uh, movie, Molly's Game, came out. And it was like, you know, five years ago, that would have been a big deal. And now it's like, okay, whatever, we, there's somebody else, they'll come, mm. you know, whatever. I mean, it's just, it's that part of the business is, is getting less significant all the time. CA will make more money this year from its investments through, um, they're owned by TPG. I don't know if any of you know it, but it's a fascinating company to look up one day. They have $75 billion in management. They redid Continental Airlines. They did Uber. They did, I mean, it's an amazing company run by David Bonderman and his partner, Jim Coulter. But they, they basically, they paid, you know, they control CA and they use it as a think tank um, now. And that's what the modern agency has become. It's much less dependent on client services. Um, how many of you have some connection to CAA? Oh, just a few, okay. So I just want to know where the ringers were gonna be in the audience. So. Um, but uh, I, before we take the questions, I thought one thing that struck me is so smart, you don't have an index in this, so everybody wants to see if they're in the book. There's no index, you gotta buy the book. Wasn't that good? I got death threats over that. <laughs> um, because uh, <laughs> I thought one of the funny things that happened though is that the studios were, who go to Capitol Hill and complain about piracy, literally had Xerox machines working day and night, cranking out my no. book. And uh, no offense, but I got three kids and an ex-wife to support. So it's <laughs> like, where's the, you know, it was a little strange, but that's all right. I'm not bitter. So let's have some questions. I'll call on you and I will repeat your question because of our audio setup. Let's start there. So the role of okay, money. Oh, I have to repeat so, the question uh, first. So, so the question is, with all the money at the agency, what role money played at the agency? I presume, in addition to like ego and gamesmanship. So, you know, at the Library of Congress, like there's this sign past this prologue when you walk into the main room. It, at CA, it could be cash equals truth. I mean, it's all about money. I'm sorry, but I don't even know what. I don't even know what second place. I mean, that's not a cynical thing, but um, at the end of the day. Um, you know, if you're an actress that used to be working all the time and making a lot of money for the agency and all of a sudden you're not, you're going to get voted off the island. You know, I mean, it is about money and, um, it's just a very, it's a very Darwinian existence. And, um, you know, uh, I love the stories of people, of directors who have been fired by the big agencies who then get picked up by a smaller agency and then wind up doing fantastic work. You know, that to me is like, that's just too delicious. Um, uh, yes, here please. Oh, the question is the where are they now? The the from the from the beginning, you know, days of yore until update. I think the most interesting one is that Ron Meyer is still at Universal. He's now been at Universal longer than he was at CA. And by the way, if you were to chart the course of Universal during those times, he's been through six owners, hmm. six owners: General Electric and um, Vivendi and Comcast and everything else. The idea that one person could survive that, I mean, I think it speaks to, you know, who Ron is um, and the fact that he's so 
loved in town. He still has a value proposition. In fact, it, like I'll give you one quick thing. So um, Harry Potter is a, uh, a big amusement ride at Universal Studios, right? Harry Potter, but it was a Warner Brothers movie. So I called Barry Meyer, who ran Warner Brothers Studio, and I said, uh, tell me about how the heck does Universal Studios get have a, higher, a Harry Potter ride? And he said, oh yeah, they, they tried for two years. And then finally Ron called me. Wow. That was it. What I mean, a those are, that, that's, that, those are the moments when, you know, you can have all the MBAs in the world doing, you know, profit and loss projections or anything like that. You know, when, um, when Paul Anderson died, who was a big star in the Fast and Furious movies, Vin Diesel and the rest of the cast, they didn't want to do anymore. I mean, he was, it's, it was, he was just part of their family. And I asked Vin, I said, what happened? He goes, well, Ron came and talked to me. And um, he convinced me that it was the right thing to do. And I'm not talking about, like the cynical version is, Ron came and said, listen, we're going to give you seven gross points versus four. It wasn't any of that. He didn't, in fact, Ron didn't mention a deal point. Like that kind of skill set in a town like Hollywood, those are the intangibles. You'll never see it in, quote, the box score, so to speak, right? But those are the kind of things that Ron does very well. Ovitz, um, he, he stopped reading Hollywood Reporter Variety and all those things um, right after he left Disney. He tried to do a management company, which um, in some ways intellectually was way ahead of its time because it was involved with digital streaming and everything else. But the fractured nature of his relationships, um, because he wanted to be feared, um, there were a lot of people that when he fell, they were happy about it. And uh, they never gave him the benefit of doubt again. So he spends his time um, in Silicon Valley um, with investments and everything else. So. Um, let's see. Yes, this lady here. Oh, I'm sorry. Looking for a hand. Yes. Brian Lord error. Uh, Brian, Brian Lord. Brian Lorder. Yes. Brian Lord error. So Brian oh, Lord Lorder. is um, one of the one of those five young guys that took over in 1995, and uh, I think in some ways, if we were to kind of trace the pedigree of his success, he's more like a Ron Meyer kind of guy. He's um, somebody that people really, really trust, and he's got a lot of important relationships. Um, I think that some people, he's from the South, and I think some people sometimes not don't get fooled, but they can get um, caught up in his Southern charm. He's a killer. He's a killer, and I would say that to his face, as, and he would take it as a compliment because when he goes to bat for his clients, like George Clooney and Jimmy Fallon and other people, um, he makes really tough deals for them. So I think that, you know, Brian has, uh, I, he's put together a remarkable career for himself. And uh, he's the kind of guy that if he hadn't been uh, at CA, he'd probably be governor down there. And the man behind you, yes, sir. There's a question about over the years, people with the standing of George Clooney, like George Clooney, have started their own production companies and what the interface is with agencies like CAA. So it used to be cyclical because back in the days when the studios were making 25 movies a year and they were printing money and then they also had these, this other revenue stream called DVDs, which were like, is enough to make you a Bolshevik. There was so much money. But the truth is, um, so there was also kind of housekeeping deals. I want, a, I want a production company. I want a bungalow and all this other stuff. And then when the, when the profit margins started to change, um, those deals became less and less. They, so they used to be vanity deals. I will tell you this. If you look at Reese Witherspoon, she has a production company. And there are production companies and there are production companies. Sometimes, you know, people just put their feet up in a bungalow and try and get something made for themselves or something. But Look at what Reese has done. I mean, it is, she's a force of nature. She takes producing seriously. She is acquiring books. She did, you know, um, Big Little Lies with HBO. She is, um, she's attached some, some kind of mission thing to her in a way. She has a mission about the movies she participates in. And I, I think it's just really impressive. But those deals are much harder to get now than they were before. Uh, yes, back here.
Oh, well, I'm proud to say I'll be having lunch at Ron's house tomorrow in Malibu. Um, they wound up, um, first Michael denied that he had bought it after he heard it from Ron. He said, no, oh, I've had that land for a while. He goes, well, then why didn't you tell me? Well, whatever. So the night of the Directors Guild, um, we were backstage and we were about to walk on and I said to Michael, I said, you know, um, there's only one person in, in the world right now that gets away with lying um, and that's Donald Trump. My question to you is, do you want to be Donald Trump? And then I walked on stage and um, my goal was to get him to um, apologize to Ron from Malibu and he did. So I, it, there were like people in the audience crying because they were so caught up in this world that these two guys, larger than life world, and the idea of Michael Ovitz apologizing that, that night to Ron about it was like, you know, I, I mean, like I give Michael all the credit in the world for that night because it, was, uh, it wasn't like there were a lot of fans in the room and he was in a tough position. And, you know, I didn't tell him that I was going to ask about Malibu, but I think that was a hint when I said that about before we went on stage. So good for him. So. Okay, a lot of dynamic women agents in Hollywood. Who could be the first woman to head CAA? You know, I'm not sure, but I have to say, it's amazing to me that they're not even partners. I mean, there's, there's kind of partners at CAA and at WME, but like in terms of principal partners, founding partners, um, there still isn't a woman there. And uh, there are, in fact, to tell you the truth, I think you could make a case now that at some of the agencies, the women agents, female agents are better than the men. I think so that that's a important. Look, I've asked that question. Uh, you know, CA is very defensive about it. Well, no, Risa Gertner is in charge of our film division and whatever. But, you know, there's different tables. You know what I mean? There's like the big tables of like the quote unquote partners. Then there's a smaller table with like, you know, the equity partners. Then there's a smaller table, table with like, okay, this is where all the decisions really get made. And there isn't a woman in there. And uh, I will say that Michael and Ron, I interviewed. Um, just wonderful agent named Paula Wagner and Rosalie Swedlin and all these. There were CA in the in 1980s really um, empowered female agents in uh, in pretty dramatic ways, and I think WME has that too now. But I think your question is a really smart one. It's just it, it's time, and it's I, you know I, I just don't know where it's going to happen. Well, at this point, as things are changing too, um, you almost see a necessity for it, the idea that women are going to bring something different to it. But what's happened in a lot of industries is that women get frustrated as they get so high but no higher, so they go off and start their own businesses, in this case, maybe their own agencies. And that may be where some of the power is moving to, rather than single, two or three big agencies. Do you think some of the smaller, more boutique, specialized agencies yeah, may I take mean that business? I think the smaller the agency, the, there is more kind of power invested in some of the women there. But I think. What's going to happen is Nicole, Meryl Streep, Reese Witherspoon, you know, at some point they're going to go to Richard Lovett and Brian Lord or whatever and say, okay, this gang of four now has to be a gang of five, you know, enough because we're giving out, we're giving speeches about there should be more female directors and there should be more female showrunners and there should be more whatever and why should the agency business be left out of that equation, you know, and at that point, um, you know, you can't say no to them, you know. There's a question here. Was Jeremy Zimmer one of the men who left CAA? Is that? He said, um, um, okay, you know. No. Yeah, this is a question about a man named Jeremy Zimmer. He was not one of the youngest, young five. He, he's now um, at UTA and um, a rather fearless um, dean of the No Unspoken Thoughts School. Um, so, okay, I think that's all we're getting out of that one. Someone else? Did we have another question? If yes, there, please. If you're a reporter, you love it because it's huh. like quoting Trump. I mean, always something pretty exotic coming out. WME. WME right now is 20. Can you repeat the question, please?
No, the CA is client-based service, about 24%. I think you said I'm it sorry, was WME. It was WME, d WME, WME, 24% of total revenue. So is WME picking up what CAA was, was with Ari Emanuel? Yeah, um, Ari is really not in the client business. Ari is, um, he's a, in some ways, he's a private equity business. He's a, uh, he's a startup business. He's a mergers and acquisitions business. Um, he's, they have um, Silver Lake, which is a gigantic private equity firm in it, SoftBank, the Japanese, Fidelity, Michael Dell. He's got major investors. He went out and bought, he decided he, was, he wanted to own something, so then if you own it, they can't leave you, right? So he spent $4 billion on the UFC. So let's, we have to wrap it up there. Please thank James Andrew Miller, and he'll be signing books. You can find more about him there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That thank was lovely. You. Thank you.